discussion of these items unless a council member or citizen so requests, in which event the item will be removed from the consent agenda and considered separately. We have the minutes, council to approve of the minutes, and the Christmas parade. I'll make the motion we accept the uh, items on the consent agenda, A and B. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Uh, Thank you very much. Motion carries. Number five, regular agenda items for discussion. A, confirmation of Benita Shields as municipal court clerk and designation of Esmeralda Hernandez and Lola Murchison as deputy court clerks. Okay. Mayor, Council, uh, according to the charter, the City Secretary and assistants should be are going to be the clerks of the corporation court or its municipal court. And so, to bring us into compliance with the charter and to have uh, these folks work in the court system, we need to go ahead and confirm these individuals as such. And uh, well, Sharon, do you have anything else you want to add to that? No, um, I have discussed this with Judge Little, and she's in agreement. And what that will be is uh, Bonita will oversee the day-to-day -day ops, but Esmeralda and Lola will be the frontline persons for when people come in, um, uh, handle the municipal court in conjunction with Bonita. Okay. So do we need to? Just a motion to accept. A motion to accept. Uh, line item 5A. Yes, and I believe we made that effective, Mayor, as of October 1st. Okay. I think that's so it was already done. Okay, Steve Gray, you motion to yes, accept. Uh, do I have a second? Ken? Second. All in favor? Uh, okay, motion carries. Uh, 5B, revision to policy for brush and furniture removal, presentation by staff of revision to better serve our community more efficiently and effectively with the goal of decreasing unlawful dumping that has and is still occurring. Mayor and Council, staff's been mulling over this for some quite time and trying to figure out what we can do better and more efficiently and effectively. And so I'll ask uh, Becky if she, to work on this and she's come up with a plan that she's been working on for some time. Hey, Mayor, Council. Um, so we have seen an increasing trend of um, large piles of brush, not necessarily citizen brush, um, but it, it takes much longer to pick up these piles. So we're trying to determine in some points if it's contractor dumping or just 
an increase in the expectation of the city to dispose of yard waste. Um, understandably, we've been a bit short-staffed, and so we've noticed this trend as we've gotten a little bit more behind. Um, but we're seeing that the most inefficient runaround time is going work order to work order because you're crossing paths and not picking up in one general area. Um, so to remedy that, we've come up with a quadrant designation that you have a graphic of um, where we can make a regular expectation of brush pickup in revolving quadrants. And so you know, many of the piles that we were seeing that didn't initially come in with a work order and were called in as complaints by the neighbors um, can be eliminated by a standard policy where we say we'll run quadrant one through four <coughs> on a rotation, um, which eliminates the need to insert the work orders. Um, with this implementation of the quadrants, we're also recommending that we update some clear written parameters for brush pickup. Um, mandating perhaps a size of a pile up to which we will pick up. And um, that can eliminate some of the issues with you know, total lot clearing. Um, because it does take the truck four or five trips to do a total lot clear, which then negatively impacts the citizens who are just focusing in on taking care of the limbs that their trees you know, need to be trimmed at that time. Um, some ideas we have to keep assisting without penalizing individual citizens, perhaps for these larger brush piles, we can offer a place to dispose of the brush, but ask that these entities that are cutting more at one time can be responsible for transporting. Um, if you look at some of the funding impacts, currently we assess a $2.50 per water bill brush pickup fee. Um, if we estimate at 1,200 bills, you're looking at 300, or, I'm sorry, 3,000 a month revenue um, with a brush truck payment of 1,628 per month plus a brush truck driver salary who's on five days a week. Um, we're looking at 4,028 a month in expenses, which um, creates a large deficit. We're also not assessing any pickup fees for when we are removing furniture. Um, which is another eyesore I'm sure that, that y'all are aware of. Um, so this has crept in from a very good place, I think, when this was started and we offered furniture pickup. Um, there were, again, people who were very conscientiously abiding by the rules, calling in when they had furniture to pick up, leaving it on the street front, um, and then that would get addressed by work order. What we're seeing now is a lot of dumping in the alleys, no work orders called in, um, which then, again, negatively affects both the team and the, the neighborhoods um, because it's just becoming a pervasive mentality that the city of Ballinger will now clean up our junk. It makes our city look trashy. We want to keep the pride in the city. Um, so I think the clear written parameters for the furniture pickup as well um, will allow us to then utilize our code, code enforcement to call out those issues of inappropriate dumping, where you see a pile of six mattresses and brush together and wood and building materials, which is common to what we're seeing in the alley. Um, finally, a lot of the alleys are very difficult for our newer, larger brush truck to get into safely and efficiently. Um, and so we would be recommending that we pick up brush um, on the addressed street, with the exception of those busier streets like Broadway, where we can designate alley pickup for those particular locations, which reduces the amount of locations the brush grid is expected to hit. Um, so I'm interested in whether you want to discuss this now or table it till later. I'm interested in your thoughts and comments on some of the amendments to these policies as recommended. Um, did you have any particular questions for me? I'd like to make a point. The uh, $2.50 brush fee was never meant to cover the entire budget. I mean, taxes, we all pay taxes for things like that as well. So I'd just like to point out that was, and I'm not saying that that's what you're saying, just the kind of way it was presented that there's a deficit. It was never designed to cover that full amount. Taxes and other things are designed to cover that as well. So. We understand that, you know that. 
So do we have any ideas of how we're going to address or even find out who is responsible for violating any of this in the alleyways? Because I know that it is a serious concern with a lot of the citizens here that, that people just don't. Mm -hmm. Large right. amounts. I mean, I had gone out myself personally to clean someone's alleyway and their dumpster, and it was atrocious. Yeah. But, I mean, do we know how we're going to handle that, and how will you find out who is actually the, the violating party? That is a definitely a tricky subject. So the idea of bringing this all together at one time, um, we've been in touch with Republic Services, and they are providing um, a plan and bid for us to do a citywide sweep of bulk pickup. Um, that would be the streets and the alleys around so we could at that one time with the enlistment of Republic services get rid of what's existing because it's clearly a problem. From that, um, whereas it's difficult to pinpoint exactly who is doing it, we would simultaneously roll out the new policy with the parameters as recommended or as decided by council. Um, and at that time, it would be more of a community watch. And when folks call in and report the legal dumping, then we can look into it a little bit easier if the city does not have a policy in place that, that removes that debris from the alley. Um, so I, I know I'm not answering your question fully. Um, That's OK. I, I think it's probably going to be a work in progress. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. And part of this is that we're also going to be working, we have a third party contractor in town right now working for ADP. Mm -hmm. And so they keep going and doing what they're doing. They get a hold of their boss. Well, by the time he gets here, he drives up to City Hall and says, hey, we just want to let you know that we're doing this. But before we can move on, somebody is coming right behind us and our guys have watched them dump more on our existing pile. And so, right. So there's already a huge delay in that reporting process. Where it would be more beneficial if they would just go ahead and call City Hall for X, say, hey, this is so-and-so with this, and this is what we just observed, and try and get code or an officer over there to catch them in the act or as they're leaving and deal with it accordingly. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just gonna be an education process of, of you know, who to call, when to call, and how to call. This is a mindset of, of Policy. Cities were designed to provide that, which citizens can't provide on their own. That's usually refuse, police, fire, water. Um, and so it's not debris, you know, pick up on mattresses, it's not fresh debris. I mean, the city is generally not in the business of picking up, clearing up a lot. Mm -hmm. That's not what it's there for for citizens. Right. So it's gonna it's gonna have to have a decent policy and change mindset that that's the city's job. It's not the city's job. If you've got that much, if you've got five truckloads on a lot, that's not the city's job. That should be your job as a, either as a contractor or a private citizen. Agreed. I do agree. And do we have a set policy for dealing with contractors dumping? I, I know it's been a, it's a, where I live, I've had a consistent problem of my dumpster gets emptied on Tuesday. Mm -hmm. By Wednesday, it's packed full of drywall and two by fours and things of that okay. nature. So the, and the ordinance and the contract specifically states what can be placed into the receptacles. Mm -hmm. um, it states that regardless of who the person putting it into it is, that you can't put any construction debris. So at any point in time, if somebody sees construction debris being entered into a receptacle, they need to call and report who it is, if possible. Um, as far as when nobody's seeing it, right. it's just kind of like in the alleys. It could be right across the fence, but it's never the person who's on the other side of the alleys. When I, and I know we've had a problem like at the airport filling those dumpsters up mm -hmm. continually with debris like that. And I was just curious if we had anything. Yeah, so it's a, it is in the ordinance, and that's considered a, an illegal dumping activity. Okay. Thank you. A lot, of, a lot of dumping in the dumpsters in the alleys. Mm -hmm. They come along and the public catches the dumpsters. Mm -hmm. And then you get this. I'm so sorry, fill I can't them wait up and they're not even paying for the dumpster. Mm -hmm. And this type of citizen 
but don't control or I'm very angry. Absolutely. Our hope is um, to, as we implement this policy and work on a citywide cleanup that's simultaneous, it will be easier to pinpoint these issues and it will be very clear to anybody who cares to follow the rules, what they are, what the expectation is. And I understand that you know, in, in past policy, perhaps the written policy was not exactly on track with what was done. And so we'd like to take a minute to just clear it all up. Okay, thank now, you. I would also just suggest that using the Building Standards Committee as another option, I'm talking about when an entire lot's being cleared or something like that, that's something that could come before that committee to be looked at as well so that they're not expecting for the city just to pick that up for free. Do you mean substandard buildings or do you mean, so I was referring the to the lot here as far as um, removal of multiple trees or multiple piles of vegetation on one land property. Right, and that's what, I'm, that's what I'm talking about is going through that building standards committee that, that the Bob's committee that was just recently formed. I think that's something that could be used as a tool for things like that as well. Because they can be flagged then for stacking all that and if they're sitting there waiting for the city to do it, then that can come before that committee and they can be told that that's not how it works. Can we, can you maybe talk with them about that yes. at a later point? I mean, there's going to be some more conversations here with the policy yeah. and tweaking it, but we want to make sure uh, council is aware of what we're looking at doing and that we're yeah. taking active steps towards trying to resolve a very definite problem. Okay. And do we need to approve of that or are we just being notified? I would, uh, this area right now is just to make you aware of it. I think we'll come back with the actual policy okay. for acceptance. Yeah, for acceptance. Okay. okay, thank you. Thank you, appreciate it. Okay, 5C, presentation from Ken Martin of Jacob and Martin Engineering addressing the Abilene Water Project. Mayor Seymour, members of council, Ken Martin of Jacob and Martin and Brian and I have been talking about uh, your Abilene Water Supply Project and we continue to work on that project, and I know there's some new council members that might be, uh, might have some questions about how did the project start, uh, how long has it been going on, where are we headed from here, what's left to be done, and so uh, Brian and I talked that it would be a good idea to visit with the council and uh, give you an update on where we are. Uh, we thought that we had received the final environmental clearance approval for the project, uh, but uh, the Corps of Engineers came back and asked for uh, the archaeologists to do a survey of historic buildings, structures, barns, anything that's considered historic within 150 feet of the pipeline. Don't ask me why, they just uh, came back after the archaeologists did all their survey and uh, so that's where we stand right now. The archaeologist is going back trying to identify any historic structures within 150 feet of the pipeline so he can do a survey of that and submit to the Corps of Engineers. We're hopeful that we'll get the final environmental approval by, we're hoping by January so that the city can have a public hearing. You'll have a public hearing for the final environmental approval uh, for the project. After the environmental is approved, then the Water Board will allow us to continue the process uh, getting the easements, the right-of-way, and doing the design of the pipeline and the pump stations. So backing up just a little bit, to talk about how did the project start, what did it consist of, and uh, I know Rick is very familiar with all of this, and I, I think Rick's been on the council since the very beginning, but, uh, or close to the beginning. But I do know back in uh, 2012, the Ivy Reservoir, I, well, let me back up even that, I'm sure, all the council is aware of the fact that your water supply comes from your reservoirs. You have two reservoirs and from the Ivy Reservoir. And so you take water from both of those reservoirs and uh, the water that you take from the Ivy Reservoir, you actually pay prior to the Abilene Agreement, you pay Miller's View Dual for the water and then you would pay Abilene for transportation. Uh, but back in 2012, and really went 12, 13, 14, 15, if you look all those years through there, the Ivy Reservoir got down to 12%, even less, uh, really critically low. 
And at that time, the ba one of the Ballinger reservoirs was empty. The other reservoir was extremely low. And so the city council at that time in Ballinger started asking the question, well, what are we gonna do if, if our reservoirs are empty and the Ivy Reservoir go, goes empty, what are we gonna do for water? And so at that time, the administration contacted the city of Abilene and asked them, could you send water to us backwards through the Ivy pipeline? And Abilene said, yes, we can do that, but it will have to be treated water because we don't have any untreated water on the south side of Abilene. And uh, the treated water cost is over 10 times what the untreated water cost is. You could do that for a while, but from a budgetary standpoint, it would be, I mean, it would be better than no water. Uh, and so the, during this whole conversation, the, the, the question was, well, how could we get untreated water from Abilene? Or from anybody? And so we uh, were hired by the city to investigate the different sources of water uh, that uh, might be available to the city of Ballinger. We looked into groundwater. Uh, we looked in, uh, we, we made contact with the city of Coleman because they had some surplus uh, surface water. The city of Col Coleman declined uh, Ballinger's request for water, but there were some negotiations that took place to get water from them. Uh, Ballinger also contacted the city of Clyde because the city of Clyde purchased a permit out of the Fort Phantom Reservoir of 2,500 acre feet. Uh, actually, there was an agreement made between Ballinger and Clyde, and it gave an option period uh, for Ballinger to do a feasibility study to see if they could get untreated water from the city of Clyde. During those negotiations and feasibility period, the city of Abilene uh, contacted the city of Ballinger and started talking about could Ballinger get untreated water from the city of Abilene. And so that went on for a number of months, uh, negotiations as to whether or not that were po was possible. Now, if all of you know all of this, then I can be quiet and we can move on down to where we are today. But long story short, it took several years of negotiation, talking about what could be done. And the city of Abilene agreed to allow the city of Ballinger access to all of Abilene's untreated water, which really, they don't necessarily like for you to publicize this, but all of their untreated water, Ivy, Fort Phantom water, Hubbard water, Possum Kingdom water, technically they're supposed to get BRA approval, but it's in the agreement. If you look at the agreement that they signed with the city of Ballinger, any water that the city of Abilene had, they make it available to the city of Ballinger. The reason that's important obviously, is because if something happened ever, we got into a drought situation where your reservoirs went dry and Ivy went dry because as you know, the Colorado River Municipal Water District controls Ivy Reservoir and they can pump it as much as they want to. I mean, they actually can pump it dry. And there was some concern that they might do that back in 2012 to 15. So if that happens, <coughs> then Abilene said we will provide you untreated water from all of our sources of water, provided that you will make arrangements to pay for the planning, acquisition, and design, which is the PADS that you got funded for, we hope you get funded for, for the pipeline that's required for us to be able to get untreated water to you. Because as it stands right now, Abilene couldn't do that. Because all of Abilene's untreated water terminates downtown Abilene, what they call the Grimes Water Treatment Plant. All of their water comes in from the north and it terminates there. And so there's a gap between downtown Abilene and Southside Abilene of about 12 miles that they would have to have an untreated water pipeline. And uh, so they agreed, if you would pay for the planning, the acquisition and design, that they would agree to furnish that water to you. So we helped the city of Ballinger go to the Water Development Board and we made a grant application and Ballinger was approved for a 70% grant. And part of that approval was contingent upon you consummating your agreement with the city of Abilene. Well, that agreement with Abilene was also dependent upon CRMWD, Mr. John Grant, signing off on the contract with the city of Abilene for, for Abilene to be able to sell ivy water to the city of Ballinger. I'm not sure how long it took to get them signed, but I know it was over a year, maybe 18 months. It, it was absurd to get somebody to sign off on an agreement that was good for everybody. But we finally got it done. 
in January of 2019 is when it was finally approved, the agreement, and then the water board said, yes, we will give you the funds now. So they approved the 70% grant, 30% loan. Uh, we closed the funding, got started on the project, started doing the surveying that was involved, contacting the landowners. Uh, before I go any further, I, I did bring some schematics uh, that I told Brian that I would bring this first leg that I was talking about. Uh, you guys may have seen this before, but uh, this is the 12 miles of pipeline from the Grimes water treatment plant uh, to the south side water treatment plant. And so as I said, Abilene did not have any way to get untreated water to Ballinger. But this segment of line that's included in the project is about 12 miles and it begins at the Grimes Water Treatment Plant, downtown Abilene, and it terminates at what they call the Harvestinger Water Treatment Plant or South Side Water Treatment Plant on the south side of town. Now from the Harvestinger Plant, they have an untreated water line that goes all the way to Ivy, which you're tied onto with the 10 inch line that is uh, on the southern part of that leg. That's where you get your Ivy water is through a 10 inch poly line, which is inside diameter is more like nine inches, eight and a half or nine inches. Uh, so this was part of the project for Abilene to be able to get you untreated water. So that's this 12 miles of line. And uh, so the second half of the project had to do with making sure that you could get, if your reservoirs went dry, if your, if your reservoirs were completely dry, the pipeline, your, your 10 inch pipeline is not large enough for you to get all the water you need on a summer usage. Now during the winter, I think you can probably get by with Ivy, but during the summer, uh, that 10 inch line is not large enough for you to be able to get all the water that you need during the summer. And so I think your treatment plant capacity is, is two or two and a half million a day, something like that. I know you don't use anything like that. Uh, but the agreement was made with the city of Abilene when that agreement was neg negotiated. Ballinger said, we would like to have access to 3 million gallons per day. That was, that was the number that was used to say, well, you've got as much water as you'll ever need. Well, anyways, 3 million a day is what Abilene committed to the city of Ballinger, 3 million gallons a day. In order for you to get 3 million gallons a day from Abilene, you have to replace that 10 inch line. Now, whether you replace it today, this year, next year, 10 years, 20 years, if you ever replace it, if your reservoirs went, ever went dry, you would be wanting to replace that line because you can't get the water that you need off the Ivy pipeline. So the second segment of the project that was involved in the pad is the line that the, in fact, the city administration, when we first started this project, adopted a route to replace your 10 inch line and with a larger line to, so that you would be able to get the 3 million gallons a day into the city of Ballinger. And so this pipeline is about 50 miles and it begins at what's called the Abilene uh, Intermediate or Inline Pump Station that is about halfway from Ivy to Abilene. And that water actually gravities out of the Ovalo tank. If you've ever been by Ovalo, there's a 10 million gallon tank there. That water back feeds down to this point. And so, and then it would back feed all the way to Ballinger. Now, keep in mind, this is all contingent upon if your, if, if your reservoirs ever went dry or for whatever reason, you couldn't use your water you could get all of your water from the city of Abilene. Now, I would say this pipeline, this 50 mile pipeline, the planning, acquisition, and design, what that includes is getting all the easements, all the right of way, getting all the environmental proof, getting the plans and specifications ready for construction or to take bids. That's when the pad is satisfied, that you've satisfied the state, you've satisfied your agreement with Abilene. It doesn't say that you have to build it. That's entirely up to the city of Ballinger, whether or not you build this pipeline. Now, the pipeline in Abilene is actually up to the city of Abilene, if and when they decide to do that. To my knowledge, they are not in a big hurry to do that, but 
They will have the right of way, they'll have the easements, they'll have the environment, they'll have a set of plans that they can, they can build on. I would suspect anybody, especially in today's market, that people will wait till PVC prices stabilize and PVC pipe manufacturing stabilizes because right now is, a, is not a good time anyway. But nevertheless, that 12 miles that Abilene has, now you, I'm sure you're asking the question, well, what is our obligation to the city of Abilene if Abilene builds that pipeline? Well, according to the agreement that you have with Abilene, it says that you will pay your pro rata share based upon capacity of the pipeline. And so there's two pump stations that are involved. There would be one pump station at Grimes, and there'll be a pump station at the south side of the plant that would pump it back toward Ballinger, uh, plus a 12-mile uh, pipeline. Originally, uh, I think even in the agreement, it talks about Abilene maybe wanting 15 million or 18 million gallons a day. But based upon what they told us with some of the meetings that we've held with them, they want more of a capacity than that. Maybe 30 million a day. And so they may decide to put in a 36 inch pipeline. That's really good news for Ballinger because the more they want, that means your is a less percentage. And so your, your percentage can go down to 10%. If they want 30 million, you're 3 million, then your percentage can go down to 10%. But whatever pro rata share of the cost at that point in time that they decide to build that would be your obligation to participate in that. Uh, I don't foresee that happening anytime soon, but you are fulfilling your commitment to them. Now, one of the immediate benefits that the city of Ballinger uh, received when you made this agreement back in 2019 was you were able to give back to the Miller's View Dual Water Supply Corporation uh, 140 acre feet per year that you were obligated to buy from them uh, I think 500 acre feet per year I believe that's right that you had to pay for uh, and the cost of that water that they were charging you was a lot more in fact I think it was uh, $1.43 at the time, maybe back in 2019, and Abilene agreed to sell you water for 36 cents. Uh, so you saved immediately. You saved about $50,000 a year just by getting that water back to Millersville. And I know that uh, Ballinger is willing to give all the water back to Millersview and buy the other water from Abilene uh, but that saved you $50,000 a year beginning in 2019. Now you do have the debt service for the 10 year note that's on this 30% loan that you have to pay, but that I guess will be paid up I think in uh, nine years or something like that, probably something in that ballpark, nine or 10 years. Yeah, the original payout showed in 30, I think, but I'm not sure about that. Uh, yeah. But you still continue to get that savings. Obviously, you're buying from Abilene a lot cheaper than you were buying from. And then they lowered the transportation cost because when you were buying from Miller's View, then they were charging you transportation. And so uh, all of that worked to your favor. But that, as far as the status of the project right now, uh, as I indicated, we are really right on the verge of getting the environmental clearance approved. Uh, once we satisfy the Corps of Engineers, I would say probably by January, we will be having a public hearing uh, here at the city uh, to complete the environmental process. Once that's completed, then we are turned loose completely to get the right-of-way acquisition. Uh, and in the pad, funds were in there to pay for the right-of-way acquisition. Uh, pay all of those costs, the easements, the access, uh, tank access, and so forth. Uh, and then continue to get the plans and specifications, uh, specifications completed. If I had to guess, I would guess that the pad will be completed in 2023, hopefully in the first quarter, maybe in the second quarter. Uh, depends on how quickly we can get everything worked out because it's really a, a two-legged process. It's one leg with Abilene, Obviously, one's with Ballinger. Ballinger is involved in all of it. Abilene is not involved in your, your leg because they don't 
you know, that's up to you, what you do. But you will be involved in both legs. In other words, you will see all the plans, all the right of way, all the acquisition, everything goes through the city of Ballinger on the path. Uh, so I'll be happy to answer any questions about the project, where we are, <coughs> what's taking place, maybe any other questions you might have about Ballinger's obligation or benefits. So what happens today if we lost capacity to do what? Where would we get it from? Well, you, you mean if you lost capacity? If we, can, if we could, if, we, if, the, if something became contaminated, could we get water from Abilene right now? Well, would he have to take the treated? You'd have to take the treated if, in other words, if, if, you're, if your water supplies were out and Ivy was out, uh, then yeah, you would have to, Abilene has agreed to send you water, and they actually verbally agreed to send you treated water. Of course, nobody wants to pay the cost, but the, but, but the infrastructure is in place that you can get the water backwards. It just would have to be treated water. So on the line that Abilene would build for our pro rata, that we would pay the pro rata share, if they chose not to build it, then what line would we use to get the untreated water? There's an new pipeline already there, right? That uh, Well, now you're, you're talking about your line comes off of Ivy. I'm talking but about you're talking about Abilene. Water no, Abilene cannot get you untreated water except Ivy until okay. this pipeline is built. Okay. Okay. They can't get you Hubbard water or Phantom water or PK water. They can't get you. They can't get anything on this leg until this is until built. Until that's built. Okay, so it's either coming from Ivy or it's treated. That's correct. Okay. Now, is this for Abilene's line? Is it still? This is just what you're presenting, or have they committed to? Because at one time they hadn't committed to what their route was. They, there were two. Yeah, we negotiated with them two or three routes, and as far as we know, this is the last route that they selected that we turned into. Uh, to the five, the engineering report that was sent in, so we, but that's the route, the last one they picked. Okay. You know, once you get down to the actual right of way acquisition, if somebody in there is so obstinate that you just, it's either condemnation or something, then they might make some uh, some deviation to that. But that is the last one they picked. I'm curious, the two inch line that Bellinger has, what is the capacity on that? You know, I think it's about um, three quarters of a million a day. I, I think it's something like that. Your, your city staff probably knows better than me, but I think it's about three quarters of a million a day. I believe it's somewhere in there. Yeah. We, we we're really public, we don't discuss capacities I understand. in locations and stuff like that. Sure. Any other questions? And just to clarify, so the prorated share that we're obligated to is for that first 12 miles of the Abilene pipeline. At that point in time, they would neck down to our 10 inch pipeline that exists currently, and we'd be responsible to either accept what comes into the 10 inch pipeline or absorb the totality of the cost from that 12 mile point to Ballinger. No, the 10 inch one is completely out of the picture. Yeah. We have to do the 15 mile line at 16 inches to handle the capacity off of what they're going to be pushing down that other system. So would yeah. we just go on top of the 10 inch or? No, we did a different route because we wanted to tie into that mobile tank coming backwards. Okay. So that you had, you, you actually at that location that we recommended, this was the route that the previous administration selected, but uh, you could get water from the south or from the north. But it would come out from the north, it'd come out of the Ovalo tank, which is really a higher pressure than you can get plenty of water in the town. But uh, it, what you were saying, John, yeah, just one clarification I just want to make on, on your part is that all of your obligated as far as sharing of Abilene is just the pro rata of your three million gallons a day compared to their capacity on that 12 miles. That's all you're obligated to do. The other part of it, as far as how much you get off the IV line, is up to the city of Ballinger. You can keep your 10 inch and get whatever capacity you can out of your 10 inch, or you can build the new 16, 15 mile segment 
to town. That's what we're getting the easements for, we're getting the design for. And so at Ballinger's timing, when they wanted to do that, then you could build a 16 and get at least three million gallons a day in the town. And this is where we were talking on the additional real estate. If we wanted to build a, an underground storage facility or a series of uh, 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 stand by the above ground as a pass through so that we constantly are maintaining a level if something were to happen to one of the other lines. That's right. They, what, what was included in this project was the possibility of the city of Ballinger actually building an earthen type open top uh, reservoir that could store several days, maybe 10 million gallons, or, uh, but an open top untreated water that you would have adjacent to your water treatment plant. And so included in this project is yeah. our funds to buy additional property where you could you could put a, 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 a an earthen type storage of 10 million or whatever that you would just have a backup if something happened to your pipelines that you would have the water adjacent to the plant. So our our ability to buy water from Abilene that is coming from IV and reducing our Miller's view water from Ivy is still tied to all of this, though, yes. correct? That wasn't possible unless we built this 12 miles in this first phase regardless. That was all tied. The ability to do that, we had to agree to do all this, correct? That's right. Okay. I just want to make We're in the middle of two 30 years contracts. Right. One with Miller and one with the city of Yeah, and I just, but I just, so it's like, we don't, it was all we may never hypothetically get water from the pipeline that we're building in Abilene, but we had to build it in order to buy water at a lesser rate for life. Yeah, yeah, actually, not even built. All you had right. to agree to right. do was to do the pad. Yeah. Gotcha. And so they may, they may never build it. Right. But you did the pad, and then you got the benefit of all these other items that they that they agreed to. And on top of that, you got a 70% grant. So right. you, you got a 30% loan, and then they agreed to give you access to all of their untreated water, even though they don't like us to say that. Anybody else got any questions? Anybody else got questions? Thank you. Ken, thank, thank you. you. you I appreciate it. Uh -huh. Be safe going home. And be assured I'll be calling and asking more questions. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay, 5D, presentation of our latest financial I'm not going to go too far into this to be like as soft numbers that you've gotten so far, but for our end of year summary for the last fiscal year, which commenced on the 30th of last month, I broke out the balances on the accounts and then a soft evaluation of what our revenues were and our expenses were for that period of the year. And it appears as though we have brought in somewhere around three quarters of a million in excess revenue over our expenses. Um, I expect by the time we get all of our final invoices in for stuff that was purchased in September, um, for that to drop about 100,000, but we did run profitable, um, which is the bottom line of it. Um, this, how does our reserves factor into that? Because I know you were also built, trying to build reserves we did so you know we went into our administrative capacity with really no background looking back at the finances and brian was here 30 days before the fiscal year started i was here three days before the fiscal year started and so we went with the best of intentions that we had to build reserves what we noticed that that was undermining some of our reserves was deficiencies in equipment like some key vehicles, some key pieces of construction equipment. And obviously, before we even had Snowmageddon, we knew that there was a deficiency in road maintenance. So we went into all that with the ambition to go after somewhere around $200,000 and adding to our surplus coffers. And what we ended up doing was adding about fifty dollars to $100,000 to our coffers, but adding about three to $400,000 worth of equipment that's paid cash for. Um, that includes some property that was acquired, um, vehicles and apparatus that across the board wasn't planned for in the budget, 
but that since we had surplus throughout the year that we were go up, we able to go ahead and without adding to our debt service, um, cash owned assets of the city. So we've built our financial foothold and stabilized it, but we've also added to our asset value. So I, I'm pleased with where we're at. As far as the other 67 pages of reports that are on there, uh, it just breaks down. And if I had gone actually line by line through each department, you'd be looking at closer to 16 or 1700 lines of budget. So I gave you a summary of each department and the key expenses that had, had expenditures in it. And it shows the revenue and the expenses for each department. And the, what I did was on that first page, I just summarized the three key funds, which is your general fund, your water and sewer fund, and, and your airport fund. So you can see the balance of expenses versus revenues on each one of those. And then obviously the bottom line is that we worked in a seemingly profitable manner. So. Okay. Anybody have any questions? I don't need any action or acceptance of this, um, but what I do need is if you guys get a chance over the next few weeks before the next meeting, if there's something you want me to dive into a little bit deeper to explain, um, please let us know and we'll get it added to you at that time and I'll go over it in a little more detail so everybody knows that it's completely transparent. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, at this time we'll have the city manager's reports. Uh, right quick, Becky, did you want to touch on the status of the pool for the workers? Council. Um, so we have been working with pool consultants to evaluate. I know we've, we've spoken at previous meetings about whether or not the pool is going to be viable going into the future, what it would cost to um, provide pool services for the community. Um, so we've been working with pool consultants to investigate the option of utilizing what we have with some infrastructure repair um, in lieu of you know, going in different direction. Um, so we started working with these consultants. They were um, chemical consultants as well as infrastructure consultants um, in the beginning of September. Um, we met multiple times. We ran a period-based leak evaluation as well uh, between the dates of about September the 20th um, and September the 23rd. And it was determined at that time that whereas there may be a few minor leaks, that the infrastructure in and of itself as far as holding water was a little bit better than we initially thought. Um, so we think we can address some of this by perhaps, <coughs> as we're addressing the infrastructure in total, by going in and recalking some of the gutters around that pool. Um, and so during these investigations and evaluations, it's necessary to hold the pool at current status, which is why we've had some complaints about it discoloring. Um, so what you're seeing in there, and we've been sampling the water for water quality, there's nothing dangerous or toxic in it. The green that's being seen is, is an algae growth. Um, but during that time of a, of a leak test, we obviously cannot do anything that affects the parameters of evaporation, adding any sort of chemicals or volume. Um, so once we did the leak test, we noted a couple of areas of infrastructure that needed to be addressed. Um, some of these being linkages between valve systems within the piping infrastructure that's inside of that pool building. Um, we have consultants on site who removed one of those main pool pumps and rebuilt the pump. So instead of having to purchase a new one, we were able to rehabilitate a very good external structure of the pump um, and save a little money that way while having a, a, an excellently functioning machine. Um, the second pool pump seems to be in very good condition and um, <coughs> will be operating just as it has in the last season. Um, we are now looking to move forward and work with another consultant to drain down the pool. 
Um, see, we cannot drain down the pool in its entirety. I know we've had some suggestions. Why don't you just take the water out of it so it doesn't have algal, algal growth, um, which is not a structural option for a pool of that capacity. So we do have to keep a certain level of water in it. Um, we are able to, while consistently flushing it, drain it down enough to then go through and scrub and disinfect the entirety of the pool and then refill it, at which point we will be able to rebalance um, the chemical constituents of that water and add the necessary chlorine for maintenance levels until we can hopefully reopen for the next season. So that will give you a little bit of a, a rundown of what's been going on. Do you have any questions at the moment? No question, just a comment. Yes. We, we've run into this situation before, and not so much as the algae green algae, mm -hmm. but as that pool sits there all winter long and the leaves and everything fall in it, we get a lot of leaf stain. And people don't understand those things. Those things are from leaves and not from algae growth. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And so once the pool is clean, then the water fine begins it. Mm -hmm. And once it's clean, then it becomes clear. Yes. And it just needs to, people just need to understand that sometimes it's, it's not an algae situation. Mm -hmm. the, leaves, the leaves stay in there and they need to stay in the thing to come out very easy. And they work. Absolutely. Some elbow grease <laughs> to combat some of the organic matter coming into the pool. We're also looking at. Um, investing in a pool cover as well as some solar screen to go around the outside of the fencing, which should actually help decrease our chemical costs because if we're able to keep the leaves from going in the pool, then we're having to treat less organic matter. Okay. Thank you. Okay, Mayor Council, I just want to remind everybody that the uh, Trump Retreat will be held on 8th Street this year on the 31st between 5 and 7 p.m., correct? Um, then also the Ballinger Police Officers Association is still doing uh, the Hallow Fest for the 30th and the 31st at the Community Center. Um, and the uh, Chamber will be having their annual uh, Hunter's Appreciation Dinner and Raffle on, this on November the 6th. And it's uh, getting to that time of year again. So uh, uh, Moonlight Madness, I believe, is set for the 23rd. And so we want to make sure everybody knows that these events are going on in the community and uh, uh, encourage them to get out and participate and be active in the things that are going on in the community in downtown. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. At this time, we'll hear a request for future agenda items. Anybody have anything? Nope. Okay. Moving along. Uh, the City Council reserves the right to adjourn into executive session at any time during the meeting to discuss any matters listed as authorized by Texas Government Code. Section 551.071, consultation with City Attorney. Section 551.072, deliberations about real property. Section 551.074, personnel matters. So at this time, we will... Uh, going to executive at 624.